Hello everybody, this is Beth Wersdale, author, and welcome to the Witty Writer Show. Oh my gosh, I have been so excited for the last month because I have with me top literary agent, Mark Gottlieb from Trident Media. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. It's very nice of you. Happy to be here. Mark, I am so stoked for so many reasons to have you with us today. Um, you are one of the top literary agents in, in the country, based in New York. Um, you're with Trident Media Group, which has been rated the top literary agency time and time and time again. Thank which, you. Which <laughs> is awesome. you to say, yes. It's, it's amazing, it's, it really, really is. Now, you've got that Trident Media has over a thousand top selling authors. I mean, we're talking award winners, New, New York Times bestsellers, mm. the collection of authors that you have who have been highly successful just speaks volumes to the talent within your company, you included. You must be you must be so proud. We are very happy about all that. You know, our uh, our good work. It, it just all that it follows our good deeds, and so we have a lot of, you know, like you say, authors who everywhere from maybe they're a New York Times bestseller or, you know, uh, something like that to all the way to like a Pulitzer Prize winner or a Booker Prize winner and a great variety of authors because it's a it's a big company as far as literary agencies go so we do a whole mixture of different kinds of books now i know because i i've i highly as i mentioned to you before we came on i do research everybody i interview and and your reputation is fantastic and it's extremely well deserved i have to say um it must be amazing to discover so much talent in the world you know especially in the US I mean that's just absolutely incredible and I don't want you know you've I know you're very very modest but it takes a real keen mind and attitude to pick up stories that you know are going to be successful mm. Yeah, I think it is really like a, a feeling you have. It's it's very visceral in a way. Like um, I would be reading a manuscript and I would just start to feel this level of excitement. It's kind of like, you know, when you're going up on a roller coaster and you're getting to like the zenith of this roller coaster. And um, I would just want to start reading the manuscript out loud to whoever else was in the room and to share it with them. And I knew what, you know, that I began to know, you know, to recognize that feeling where in reading something, you just have to share it with someone. And then you know that it's the right kind of book to you know, bring to the general public. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I've got background with songwriting as well. And there's, there's always been certain songs that you hear and all of a sudden you'll get goosebumps and you think, oh my gosh, that's going to be a big hit. Is that something that happens to you when you're reading a manuscript where you, you're reading it and all of a sudden you get goosebumps th with excitement thinking, oh, this could be it. This could be the next big thing. Mm. Yeah, no, there are times where I've definitely had that feeling. And then sometimes it does equate with that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it goes on to find a publisher, the author goes on to find their audience and the book is a big success. Other times it's more circuitous, like, you know, there were times where I thought that about an author and then sometimes, you know, maybe nine months goes by, there weren't any nibbles from publishers, but then someone decided to bite and, you know, we did for that author, we did an audiobook deal on top of it. We had optioned his book for film and TV rights and, you know, he was very, very happy. It was his debut novel. So um, it happens in all sorts of ways. And then there are the books which even when they go on to get published, sometimes they have what seems like a quiet publication and then they just backlist extremely well. They become a, a bestseller almost out of nowhere. It's just amazing, isn't it? I, the, the, the publishing world is is so much bigger than, than we realize. And I, I have to say, before I published my books, 
I had no clue how huge the publishing industry is. It was a complete eye-opener to me. And it, and it sort of blew my mind for a little while. It was a bit intimidating, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I realized, you know, how big of an industry it is. Um, it, it, it is. It's mind-blowing. It really, really is. We've got lots of people who have joined us. So I just want to mm. give some people a, a, a shout-out for joining us, if that's all right. Sure. Have a look. Um, we've got Suzanne, who's joined us. She says, hello, Beth and Mark. We've also got Josephine, who's in the UK. Uh, Carla Lewis, she says, hello as well. And uh, we've also got Scott Lloyd. He says, thank you for hosting this. You are very welcome, Scott. You are very welcome indeed. And we've also got Jennifer Greer, who says, hi, Mark. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> we've also got Autumn Bardot. Now, Autumn is actually my co-host for our new group that we've just recently created called Write Better, Author Smarter. Um, and like you, Mark, we we been actively trying to help authors, especially during the time of the pandemic and, you know, give them ways they can help themselves and the tools they need from experience. Um, and she is absolutely fantastic, bless her. Um, we've also got Terza in Germany. She said, hey, I'm here, woo mm -hmm. <laughs> She's got the bit, most bubbliest personality, honestly, she really has, fantastic author as well. We've also got Heather who's joined us. Um, Heather actually works at a New York library um, in, I don't know whether I'm going to pronounce it right, I want to say scholarly, but scholarly, um, and I recently hosted um, an event with them, which was absolutely fantastic, that was for authors and writers. Um, mm -hmm. We've also got, let's have a look, we've got Okay, I don't know how to pronounce your name, I'm afraid, and I don't want to get it wrong. I want to, oh. I have no clue. I am sorry. Any any ideas, Mark? I'm sorry, it's such an unusual no. name. Jogan Egan. Jogan Egan. Well, hello to you anyway from Ireland. Thank you for joining us. We've also got Wendy who's joined us and Robin. Hello, Robin. And Jenny, who actually hosted the library program with me last week she's fantastic and we got gloria um oh and terza says thank you so much and your writing of course is me oh she's talking about my books i'll talk thank you terza <laughs> she's so sweet so thank you everybody for joining us if you've got any questions for mark please put them in the comments um you only have to put the question in once and i will see it and i will try and put your question up on the screen for Mark to see. Now, I have already prepared some questions as well, um, thinking about the most common things that people generally ask Mark. I'm not gonna try and put you on the spot or embarrass you, because I hate that myself. Mm. <laughs> now, you've got such a wealth of experience, which I think is absolutely amazing, because you've worked with different departments within the publishing industry haven't you mm -hmm. so you've done foreign rights and and the audiobook side as well as sort of the promotional side and everything mm -hmm. um bearing all that in mind obviously that's given you a lot more experience than a lot of literary agents what are the most common mistakes do you think authors make when querying what are the most common ones which are no-nos don't do it Oh, I mean, there are, I always say there's so much you can do wrong in a query letter. It's almost easier to focus on, you know, what they can do, do right, you know, most easily. But some of the worst things I can just tell you right off the bat uh, would be, you know, if you queried an agent and they said, oh, this sounds great. I would love to read the manuscript. And then you say, well, I haven't written it yet. You know, it's because... <laughs> Uh, I can understand, you know, wanting to sort of test the waters and see if something would work well in the marketplace or interest an agent or an editor. But, you know, you have to kind of have all your ducks in a row ready to go to begin the querying process. And, uh, you know, I would also say along those lines, um, sometimes people just don't have the right word count that adheres to maybe whatever kind of book or genre they're writing. So it kind of needs to adhere to all those normal conventions. And then sometimes you get a very short query letter that just says uh, I, one line, like, I would love to work with you. But 
it doesn't tell you anything about the person or their book. It just sounds nice, but you know. Yeah not doing themselves any favors one of the things autumn and i try and express through our group is the importance of research mm -hmm. from start to finish and it's so important isn't it mark i think mm -hmm. if you're going to try and do something in a professional arena you have to be professional um and and research is the key and there's so much information out there from legitimate places that will give you what the word word count is for your genre, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, mm -hmm. you know what type of um, format you need to do with with you know per chapter and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. All that information is there, isn't it? So it, definitely, research is the key. I think before contacting any literary agents, it's as you said, it's getting all your ducks in a row and, and making sure you're you're making a good first impression. And I, and I think that's the, the one thing that I tell a lot of authors is you only get one first impression and that's it, isn't it? And for you, that's especially important because every query letter you get is a first impression of not only the author, but also the book as well. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, it's uh, it's every author's storefront and your first opportunity to not only showcase you know who the author is and what the story is about, but the actual quality of their writing. So it's really a window <clears throat> into all of that. And um, I mean, the first impression of the first impression is really that kind of first line or two of the query letter where, you know, really the hook to the story or the elevator pitch should go up front because um, it needs to grab people's attention right away in order to sort of draw them into the rest of the letter and then be convinced enough to request the manuscript. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And it's, it's very interesting because I, I'm, I feel very, very lucky because I was always a salesperson and a marketing person before I became an author. So I, I'm like you, I've, I've got a wealth of experience, which has really and truly helped me in so many different ways. But a lot of authors, you know, don't have that sales and marketing background or, or way of thinking. And, and when you're querying a book, you really are selling it, aren't you? You're selling your story. You've got to try and sell the idea, the concept, the storyline of it, and it, as you said, it's got to be intriguing enough to think, okay, I, this, I might be interested in this. I might want to look a little bit more at this. <laughs> I always thought that was one of the kind of most interesting or funniest things, how, <clears throat> you know, in the humanities, you know, if you were an English major or studying history and then you were ready to publish a book and that, you know, your area of expertise, you didn't learn really about contacting agents and then, going on to getting published, you know, any of that. And people sort of just re will rely on whatever is just available to them on, on the internet, which some of it is good. Some of it is, is sparse and, you know, the conferences and workshops sometimes help. But uh, it just reminded me like, you know, when we were kids, they don't teach you how to do your taxes in school, right? And then when you're, <laughs> you're all ready to go, you know, you need to bring this stuff to a tax expert pretty much. But so yeah. it is it is sort of a strange thing for a lot of writers to have to know to market and promote themselves in their work to be appealing to an agent or editor. Yeah, absolutely. And I would definitely recommend that any author, you know, if they're looking at querying a, a, a you or anybody else is, is have a look at examples of successful queries mm -hmm. that are properly formatted so you can see the type of thing that you need to be doing and i'm sure mark would agree it's it's research look into it and, and find out what you need to do <laughs> yeah i mean just just to touch on this very briefly like the good query letter in my opinion i think is just very simple one page you know um that upfront one line or two about the hook or the elevator pitch, you know, maybe mention a couple of comparative titles to your book, a couple of body paragraphs detailing some of the exciting plot details of the book without too many spoilers. And then, you know, an author bio, one paragraph author bio at the end, and you have yourself a good letter. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, do you know, I, I think after writing mine, I think writing my description and information to go in a query letter, I actually found harder than writing the novels because <laughs> as a writer, you, you are so excited about your story. You know every aspect of it and what happens. And, and I think it's very easy to overcompensate and try and fit too much information into that short space. And it's very difficult to, to try and remove elements that you don't need to share straight away. Um, I mean, I'm very lucky because, um, you know, Autumn and I, we, we have really good independent strength so we help each other mm. and i think having that sort of body system between us is fantastic i've got the sales marketing brain she's got the literary you know ex education experience so we help each other and balance it we're like yin and yang it's fantastic <laughs> it really really works um but when i recently redid my descriptions because i wanted to you know do a, a slightly different spin on my my own marketing um she was the one that had the ruthless edge to say, no, you don't need that. You don't need, mm. no, no, cut that out, mm. do that. And I think having that sort of support is very important for authors. Oh, um, yeah, certainly. To find to, writing groups and, and things like that. Yes, to have, to get real feedback and not just friends and family members, because sometimes they will be honest with you and other times they just, you know, they don't want to hurt your feelings, but to get, um, some people will take their, their query letters out for critiques and things like that. Um, but, uh, I think one of the, the best things writers can also do is just sort of read the back cover copy of a book, the jacket copy, because if you really look at that or even the product page, you know, online, the way the information is disseminated is very similar to how it's pre presented in a query letter. And then, you know, it carries over to the publisher as a good pitch, you know, from an agent because query letter works so well, and then the publisher repurposes it as jacket copy. So it's very yeah. important. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's amazing. I've learned so much over the last few years. I, I wish I could go back in time with the knowledge I have now. <laughs> but it, it can't happen. It can't happen, unfortunately. Um, Scott's got a very good question. I'm just going to pop this on the screen for you. Uh, Scott says, I had a blog piece go viral last year, 2.5 million views. That's amazing, Scott. And continues to get hundreds of views a year later. Is it important to include this information in pitching his memoir? The piece and his memoir intersects around race, class and religion in South, uh, in American South. Mm -hmm. in Thing. So would you say something like that would be important to, to add to a query letter? Definitely. For Well, even it's even becoming imp important for uh, the world of fiction. But for nonfiction, the platform is what really sells books. Um, publishers want to see someone who has a really big social media following or big uh, subscriber base. And so as much as possible, if you can really throw numbers in the eyes of publishers, they're thinking if just a fraction of those people that audience buys the book were in terrific shape they love a built-in audience so for you know memoir is also interesting you know in that it's kind of at this intersection of fiction and non-fiction but um i think it's still important they want to know not just you know who, what the story is but who, who the person is telling it you know yeah. and they're telling it from a soapbox or a broadway stage yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you know, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Because I think this last, you know, year or so with the pandemic, it's, it's basically forced so many authors to to all of a sudden have to use social media and, and learn new skills. Um, I feel quite lucky that I started way before, you know, way back before the pandemic started so it wasn't so difficult with me but I have seen a lot of authors struggle with using social media to try and keep the momentum going with their books and and try and build their following and everything is it difficult for you as a literary agent to encourage your authors to try and be active on social media because a mm. lot of authors are very introverted aren't they 
Yeah, it's the strangest thing. I think there was a time in book publishing when you could simply write the book and then kind of send it out into the world and you know that your part of it was done and the publisher would would promote the rest and times have changed in such a way that um, publishers rely so much more on authors now. Um, there are certain authors who do get the right level of attention from publishers, but um, I think they, they still do pitch in. And uh, it's right, you know, you're right. It's very hard to be a, of two minds, like a creative person and then having to, you know, promote oneself when writing is such a solitary thing. So. Uh, you know, we try to encourage our clients in, in a few different ways and to also work with publishers. I mean, one of the first things we do with publishers is you know, once they've bought the book and we're get, gearing up for publication, we ask a publisher for their marketing and publicity plans in order to be able to review them, comment and improve upon them, you know, all in the spirit of success. And then at the same time, we ask the publisher for like a basically a production calendar of events. So the author knows, okay, on this date, my book cover will be ready so I can debut my book cover. Um, on this date, you know, we'll have a final manuscript so I can send it out for additional you know, reviews. And so basically, so they're, they're not just sort of feeling around in the dark. And what we then also do is, you know, we obviously we've interfaced with a publisher. I mean, we have a digital media marketing department that helps you know, working with them and clients, but also we find ways that things that the clients can do, basically, like what you say in terms of social media, blog outreach, things like that, where, you know, it wouldn't necessarily require the help of the publisher, and you know, things that they're able to do too. Yeah, yeah. No, is it what one of the other things that really impresses me, Mark, with you is is the fact that you really do have your finger on the pulse when it comes to you know social media, what's starting to trend, what's really catching on, and you seem to be able to get straight in there, which just goes to show you know how much attention you pay to the market and you know book wise, but also on the social media as well. Um, is it something that you just instinctively monitor or do you actively look and pay attention to what is starting to trend or, or starting to pick up pace uh, for a particular genre or a particular book or a particular theme? Does it just come naturally to you? Well, I mean, we, first of all, you know, every week I look at the New York Times bestsellers list before it's published by the New York Times. We get it, I think, one or two weeks in advance of when it will run in the Sunday paper. And so I can, um, on the right hand side of each of these titles, they say how many weeks they've been, the book has been on the list. And every time I see the number one next to it means that book has just debuted on the New York Times list. And I pay very special attention to that to see, well, what has just broken out into you know the bestsellers list. Obviously, sometimes it's from an author we already know, like Nora Roberts or you know someone like that. But other times, uh, it's something very new and interesting and different. And you you catch on to something going on in the marketplace. And we also drill down on that information even more in that every week we also look at the. It's called a NPD for Nielsen Book Scan. Um, Basically, it's the same company that does TV and radio uh, ratings. They also do the same thing for books. And you can drill down into a lot of information there and see as a bestsellers list information, which is a lot more accurate than the New York Times. The New York Times basically grades on a curve. They, uh, you know, just sort of approach the top 10 uh, biggest book retailers. They ask, what was your biggest best-selling books in a week. And then they kind of, you know, just measure, you know, based on that. It's not really accurate. In doing that, essentially what they're doing is they're, they're looking at velocity of sales. That's what the New York Times is interested in because a book lives in a store for a certain period of time. With Nielsen, it's a lot more accurate sales reporting. It's, you couldn't get more information than if you were to pick up the phone, call the publisher and ask them how many copies they sold of a book. Wow. That's, yeah. That sort of information must be so valuable from a business sense. I mean, that, that that's fantastic having that sort of information on hand to, to let you know something that could possibly just 
about to explode on the scene. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Oh, yeah. And sometimes these are self-published books or books with small presses that you see climb onto the Nielsen list. And then I like to reach out to the authors, you know, who were, were able to do that. And, um, you know, other times it's sort of like you say, just watching what's going on in social media and the news and, and what might catch on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was most impressed when you when you when you spotted James Breakwell. I mean, that was fantastic. I mean, you jumped on him like yeah. he, like he like he was about to explode. Like, I mean, just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> what perfect timing as well. Um, just to give everybody an idea, James Breakwell is a fantastic author, um, and he is the one of the funniest guys ever. Um, he he's got young children who he tweets about, and it just caught on because he was um he got there was a story on buzzfeed about him as well wasn't there um fantastic guy i mean for him to to use his experiences with his children and the funny things they come up with to then you know launch himself and I, i'm sure a lot of it was accidental but it just caught on because he's got such a great sense of humor and everything i think it's super important for authors to use their strengths to to get success and to to push forward their careers isn't it um yeah. just like myself with my sales and marketing background and, and doing this type of thing there are authors out there that have amazing strengths which they should use to try and get noticed yes and, and I, I think i think james is the perfect example of that really isn't he really i mean he um so he actually has a background as a screenplay writer. He was kind of moonlighting and doing that. And um, you're ex exactly right to say that he sort of in an accidental way found a really big social media following. And, you know, I think he surpassed a million Twitter followers. Um, and um, what happened was he basically had created a, a parody account called Very Lonely Luke, where after uh, the the Star Wars reboot, the new uh, the new one, we at the end of the movie we see uh, Luke Skywalker, you know, alone, monk like in the mountains, and we wonder how he got there. And then the movie suddenly ends. So he created this Twitter account that kind of just pontificates of why he could really be there, and it's written from his perspective. What happened was um, the uh, the actor who plays Luke Skywalker. I'm blanking on his name, Mark. Um, Don't ask me because I'm the worst when it comes to names. Yeah, it'll come back to me. But he, <laughs> so he started following James's parody account and retweeting it. And what happened was he got a following in the millions, and then he encouraged his follower follower base, which he had built there, to follow his other account. And um, so it happened very organically. That's I think. What, what people have to do. You have to try different things, see what catches on. You know, if something's not really working, you know, you know, obviously don't keep doing that, but it also has to feel very natural. You know, there's some people who they, they feel like they need to be on every social media platform, but they can't get the hang of Twitter or they can't get the hang of Instagram, you know. It's, it's tough, isn't it? I, I, you know, I'm across all platforms and, and I manage it fairly well, I have to say. Although Twitter moves so fast, it's difficult to keep up with because you can literally post something, leave, come back in an hour. Well, and it's not in the feed, yeah. Yeah, you're like, where on earth did that go? Or you're, you've been tagged in something and there's so much, so many tweets, you don't know where it actually began. So... Mm. <laughs> so I do feel for people's frustration when it comes to social media. But as you said, I think it's important to to do what we're comfortable with and try and make the most of whichever one works best for us, I think. Um, we've got, oh, there we go, Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill, that's right. There you go, look, see, my Witty Writer Show viewers are fantastic. They are so on the ball. They are mm. fantastic. Oh, and, and Donna says, yes, oh, my God, I love James Breakwell. He's brilliant. There we go. So I'm not the only fan. He's he's so funny. I've got four children, Mark, and the fun, the things that my, my kids have come out with, oh, my God. And I think when you're a parent and you see tweets like that about kids. You can relate. You can relate. I literally, when I was heavily pregnant with my daughter and my 
two-year-old came walking into the bathroom while I was busy and he had a sanitary towel stuck to the side of his face with the wings <laughs> out saying, look, mummy, plaster. Like yeah. that. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, <laughs> you, you, you can't, trying to invent things like that, you just can't predict it, can you? You really can't. So I wish James the most success because it's just fantastic. It really, really is. Now, I wanted to get back to the query letter for a second mm -hmm. because one of the issues that I had um, as a new author when I first started, because my books were a very different original concept, the one thing I struggled with was trying to find comparisons yes it was really tough the only thing i could think of was um like stephanie myers the host and then maybe crossing that with with ancient aliens and mm. avengers endgame and i'm thinking mm. would that make sense to anyone mm. you know but it was really really difficult now i know i'm not the only one because it within our our group our writer support group we've had quite a few authors that have struggled with trying to find comparisons mm. is there any tips you can give authors of of how to to try and express to an agent sure and you know I can, I can share this with you as well in in the chat dialogue box here i don't know if there's a way to show that too we can put it in the links at, at the end if necessary or if you would like, I can share my screen and I can show you basically what I'm looking at here. But it's a short article I wrote on my blog just to, because I saw this was something that a lot of writers were really struggling with. And, um, you know, putting together comp titles for your book is not really as simple as my book is this meets that. It really means a lot more uh, than that. Uh, what putting together, I mean, we call them comp titles in the industry, but you can say competitive titles or comparative titles. What it does is it, it one, it holds your book in high esteem to, you know, compare your book to, uh, you know, really ideally a, a bestseller published within the last five years of the age range of the genre. So if you've written, you know, perhaps, you know, women's fiction or romance, you wouldn't necessarily compare it to a children's book. Um, so you want to kind of be accurate in that sense. And um, what this does is in, in having selected good comp titles, and they really need to be books, not movies. Yes. We're trying to figure out where books go in a store, not necessarily where they would, you know, go on Netflix. Um, and what that does is a few things for you. It's the magic bullet in terms of finding, okay, which agent or which editor published that book? Because then I know that's the person I want to work with. And then what it will also do for writers in the long run, and they'll be really miles ahead in having gone through this process of assembling some good comp titles, uh, the publisher uh, runs what's called a profit and loss statement, like a lot of businesses will do, or a P&L sheet, sometimes call it. And basically the magic numbers, if you can really make book publishing into a science, um, you know, the magic numbers they're projecting for how successful your book can be are often the comps. And I think a writer will always be in a stronger position to tell the publisher what they think the comps are than to let the publisher try and come up with it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you, if, the, if they're good comps, publisher runs their P&L, publisher might make an offer in accordance with how successful those comps were, which would be great. And then where it also finally becomes really important is kind of the end result where now your book is going into a store and you're going to reach the readers. Well, guess what question Waterstones or Barnes and Noble will be asking, you know, um, the publisher, you know, what are the comps? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that makes sense from a business point of view. That absolutely does make sense because obviously, you know, for, for your for any publisher, it's an investment, isn't it? They've got to be able to rationalize whether it's going to be a good investment or not, judging by how other book, books have done similar to that. So, it, you know, it makes complete, complete sense. Um, thank you for answering that, because as I said, it's one thing that so many authors do struggle with. Um, and I think the reason I struggled with it so much is because I'm actually, believe it or not, a huge horror fan. Mm. 
I've always loved horror books. Stephen King, mm. James Herbert, I love all that. Mm. Um, although I, I love sci-fi and horror, but I had no mm. plans on writing a sci-fi mm. book. So I hadn't re read as many as horror books. So I was like, I can't think of anything similar. So thank you. I appreciate that. I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> well, the best tools for this stuff are, you know, Goodreads, Amazon are fantastic tools because sometimes you'll look up a book on there and it will say customers who bought this also bought or also viewed. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just leads you kind of down the rabbit hole. Yeah, absolutely. Research is key, everybody. Research is key. Um, oh, we got a quick question comment from terza with regards to social media she says i find twitter the worst and you can never write longer posts and I, and she's not one for one-liners mm. <laughs> yes i understand you are terza she she does excellent posts i've got to be honest with you um let's have a look we've got some more comments before we go through let's have a look oh my gosh i will try and get to as many comments as i can and for some reason, it looks like I froze a little for a second, I think. Um, Autumn says, writers need to understand the importance of comps. And yes, right. absolutely. And Mark definitely agrees with that. Um, my next question goes back mm -hmm. again to, to social media, because obviously mm -hmm. it's, it's so prevalent mm -hmm. in today's business for, for publishers, for you as an agent, for the authors. And I know you are an avid user of social media, which I think is a fantastic because embracing technology is, is what keeps everything going forward. When you get a promising query, is that something that you look at? It, 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 how active they are, what their following is, and is it something that people should put into a query or just let it leave it to the agent like yourself to look if you're interested? I think uh, if you're an author of nonfiction, because the platform is so important, if you do have a strong social media following or, or, or something like that, then definitely include that in the query letter. Um, sometimes I suggest like in the author bio paragraph, maybe after that paragraph, or if you want to embed a link in text, you can include a link to an author website or social media page. That's a good place to, to do that. Um, in the world of fiction, it never used to really matter, you know, because that publishers understood uh, it's about the quality of the writing and by extension of that, the, the writer will be, you know, a success. Um, and more and more, which is kind of troubling to me, is publishers are interested in, in that kind of thing for fiction writers, which is very scary because, you know, they didn't go to school for that kind of thing. Like we talked about with the marketing and all that. And really what, what should it matter? I mean, it's, it's, it's how good the, the book is not, you know, who's, who's following them or how big their social media following is. Luckily that it, it's not, it hasn't fully caught on, but I've come across that with a couple of publishers. So I think it can't hurt to basically in that, that all, one paragraph, that author bio, just to list off all the relevant writing experience, writing credentials, but also, you know, show that you have some kind of presence online. And even if it's not a strong one, at least there's something there, foundation upon which to build. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, I've noticed myself, there are, there are some, you know, authors that have great big followings, either on TikTok or, or Twitter or whatever, um, but they're not actually related to their books. They don't, it's not because of their books it's to do with something else um and that that sort of to me that was a missed opportunity but yeah i, I think you're right maybe publishers do need to sort of it's a bit of a minefield really isn't it sometimes you know the real meritocracy should be just not necessarily who the writer is just the writing itself yeah but the internet people um they love they have so and stuff like that. So until until publishers wake up to something else, you know, when they realize it, they couldn't rely on the data in that way because it's an art form. It's not an exact science. Yeah, it really, really is. And I think we've all seen, you know, 
massive changes in the market because of books that have just exploded onto the scene that have come out from nowhere and just took everybody by storm. And sometimes you just can't predict that, can you? You really, really can't. Um, okay, so Claire has got a question for you, Mark. She says, do you have a most memorable moment from a query letter, something that instantly made you take notice? <laughs> vampire tanks. It's exactly what it sounds like. Like half vampire, half tanks. <laughs> and I wanted to go for it, but I didn't know if I know a, a, you know if a publisher would. And I had never heard anything like it before. <laughs> when I read vampire tanks, my mind went to all sorts of, and I had to, I had to see just for myself what it was like. But, oh my gosh! Or, Do you know, um, it's funny. I bet you could literally write a whole book just on some of the queries that you've received over the years and, and how bizarre some of them have been. Oh, because I say that the, the human mind is a scary place, Mark, and I'm sure there are lots of people that come up with so many weird and wonderful ideas. Sometimes you must you must pick something up and go, did I just read <laughs> that right? Is that what it says? <laughs> some of them, yes, some are really, really memorable. And, um, you know, there was this one author who... She had written, it was her debut novel. Uh, it was a fantasy, epic fantasy. Um, she didn't have much of a background in writing. She had, she was an Arabic linguist and was in the US Army and other things. Um, she made her, her, her book like 800,000 words. And, uh, and I said, you know, I had to say to her after I read it, I said, you know, you have enough here for maybe six or eight books. And we ended up chopping it up into like three different books and we sold wow. it. We actually sold her in a debut, in a five book deal to her publisher. Um, but I, most people who would have seen that would have just you know, screamed and ran in the other direction. But the quality of the writing in the letter was so good that I had to request the manuscript. And then I had to know who was the person who was willing to, you know, because normal book length is 80 to maybe under 20,000 words for fiction. Yeah. And here she has this 800,000 word book. I mean. That's phenomenal. That was, yeah. You must have read that manuscript, realized how many books you could get out of it and, and thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is a literary agent's dream. It was good in a lot of ways because we were able to chop it up and make it into a series. Um, but if it can't, if it can't be done, then it is sort of like trying to fit like an elephant in a corset. It's not going to be able to happen. And then if you have the opposite problem, sometimes that's even worse. There are books that come to me, which if they're novella length, you know, it's very hard to sell to publishers because uh, the margins for profit for publishers are too small and things like that. Yeah. And then so authors will try to really pad in more words to bring the word count up. But you you really got to be adding muscle to bone, never fat to bone. And what happens is, you know, sometimes it can be done and other times not. And then it, with longer books, you've got to look at them in terms of economy of language and things like that. So um, it, it can present challenges, both both types of things. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough, isn't it? And I think that's really tough as a writer, trying to be ruthless with your own work is one of the hardest things ever, which is why, and I'm sure you agree with this, it's so important to get a good editor, you know, but, you know obviously we're all on different budgets, but try and get a, a good editor for your money to try and get your manuscript as tight as you possibly can before it goes to someone like Mark, um, where it's going to get that first impression. It's super, super important. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, a lot of people do. They they at least workshop their manuscript before bringing it to agents, just as polished as if you can, as polished as you can get it before you approach agents. Yeah, and and friends and family don't tend to be as ruthless and honest with you as you would like, everybody. <laughs> so try try and get somebody who's going to be impartial and tell you tell you how it is. It will make all the difference. Um, okay, Jennifer's got a good question for you. She says, "Is it important to publishers for authors to have a large email list?" Oh well, some authors are famous for for having a 
wonderful email list and it does help to entice publishers. Um, there are uh, a couple of great things to use. One is there's a, a website for blogging, which I'm actually thinking of moving my, I'm on Squarespace now just because it was easy to build the site, but I'm thinking of moving it over to Formstack because you can actually, for writers too, I mean, you can, you can monetize that site well. And then I think it has an integrated kind of mail newsletter type thing. Otherwise, a lot of people will use uh, MailChimp. Yes. And they can, you know, import their contacts to the newsletter. Um, I think it's a great way to reach people by email and then to have something that sticks online and then to share through your social media accounts. Um, but publishers are nowadays are not just looking at the numbers of things, but the level of engagement. They've gotten a lot smarter because people were in the past able to pay for followers. And a lot of them were bots or just, just goldfish basically. And so you saw accounts that maybe they had like a million followers, but then when publishers got a little smart, they started noticing, oh, well, they have a million followers, but how come one tweet only has like seven oh, retweets? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so now publishers look to see if that carries through to the level of engagement. And look, the good news is for authors is sometimes, I mean, you don't necessarily always need to have like a million followers. Like if you have that dedicated audience, people who are really engaged with you and your work and you can kind of show that uh, to publishers, then sometimes that's a lot more convincing than, you know, someone just throwing something out there to the ether and asking a bunch of bots or goldfish, whatever to, to buy their new book. <laughs> I agree. I know that's one of the things I've noticed from from a self published point of view as well. Is I get so I'm constantly inundated, especially now my reviews are building up, building up. Even more so now, I'm constantly getting emails and messages from from people saying, "Oh, I've got this many followers. I want to promote your book and blah blah." And you're absolutely right. You go on there and they've got eighty odd thousand followers, but two likes on their posts. I think any author needs to be aware of that because there's so many scammers and, and so many people out there just trying to make money off vulnerable authors who want to succeed. Um, but again, it comes back to research, doesn't it? And researching, if it sounds too good to be true, sometimes it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, the best thing anyone can do is just look at you know, the actual data, you know, in terms of an agency, like you mentioned earlier in the show, when you, you introduced our agency, we uh, rank first in the agency world in book publishing for number of deals, amount of money for deals every year consecutively since 2004. You know, we have similar rankings in, in, in the UK and in international markets. Um, you know, that our work should just speak for itself. That's like the kind of the best thing you can do. Anyone can go on the internet and say anything or promise anything, but you have to look at the, the actual kind of work that was done. That's what ultimately tells the story. I'm, I myself, you know, I'm, and this is not, not to toot my own horn. I, I mean, it is good information. You know, I actually typically lead the agency where I work in number of deals in any given six to 12 month period, which, will speak volumes, not just given the agency's rankings, right? But it's important because most of those authors were new or debut authors. Like um, there might be a lot of folks like that on your show, listening to your show or watching your show. And then, um, you know, you can open the acknowledgement section of books like that, which have published, you'd see my name and the thank yous. So usually stuff like that is kind of a good way to go, you know? So like when you're looking at publishers, you know, maybe you're comparing like a Penguin Random House or a Hachette to, you know, a smaller independent publisher. Well, you can see how they stack up from the yeah. books they publish and, and how successfully, no matter what one or the other tells you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that brings me on to another question, actually, because nowadays, you know, obviously self-publishing is is. is become more accessible to a lot of people mm -hmm. um, and I think there are a lot of authors who are just 
too scared to approach a literary agent and they feel it's safer just to do it by themselves because you know it's is there's less failure if if they don't get picked up um but going down the publishing route traditional publishing route gives so much more opportunity doesn't it to to authors because all of a sudden you're going from somebody like myself who's having to do everything themselves to having the the support and the backing of a top literary agent like yourself a big publishing company and then the opportunities for maybe um you know foreign rights movie deals etc sure. yes turning your book to a global audience so i think it's super important for authors to realize that sometimes you have to go for it and take the opportunity to push for a traditional published career yeah you do have to try and get out there and 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 at least test the waters and see what what might come of it there are definitely pluses and minuses to both i mean there was a time i think certainly in self-publishing where it was almost like the dot-com bubble like a lot of authors made wonderful success for themselves there but what happened was like with the dot-com bubble a lot of this stuff eventually you know it just kind of burst and um what's happened now more recently and i think a lot of self-published authors can kind of attest to this it's become a much more crowded marketplace there's just sort of this glut of material there and you know like yourself beth you need to be um like a marketing guru to really make a success of it and so um, because otherwise it's just, there's, there's just a sea of books out there and the average self-published book in the lifetime of the book will probably sell less than 10 copies, you know, and that's if you're just your friends and your family members, at least the ones who really care about you bought the book. <laughs> but, but, you know, what the, the, the thing too is that's also challenging is it's become a race to the bottom in terms of the pricing of these books. So you see a lot of books that go as low as, 99 cents and you have to sell a lot of them in order to make business sense of that like it's like the what we call like the mcdonald's or the walmart effect uh, whereas publishing is different in that we're not selling mcdonald's hamburgers we're probably selling you know like kobe beef burgers or something like that and so you you make the numbers up differently but also i think the benefit of being the traditional publishing are a lot of the things you said um you know, uh, it lends a lot of provenance to writers in the eyes of book to, the book to film and TV community, uh, publishers doing foreign rights, you know, for books and translation. Yeah. Uh, and all of this stuff creates additional revenue streams for authors. Whereas when you're in the self-publishing space, it's you a lot of, there's a tendency to think, well, I have good income coming in from my eBooks and I, I have control over that but it's just one revenue stream, right? It's not everything. And so people kind of get, I think, a little bit obsessed with having a lot of just, you know, kind of nothing rather than a little bit of something, you know? Yeah. And um, so being with a publisher will help the distribution. You get out of just the ebook space into print, audio, foreign, book to film and TV and everything else. And I think that's how you begin to reach a larger audience. And the people who kind of weathered the storm through the changes in self-publishing best sort of had their foot in both sides of the saddle. Maybe they continued a little bit their self-publishing, but they also found their way to a traditional publisher just in case, you know, things got rocky in one space or the other. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's amazing because I, I you know, you have such a talent of not only seeing what, you know, knowing whether a book's going to be great or not, but seeing the potential of possible movie deals and where it could lead to. And let's face it nowadays, especially with things like Twilight hitting the exploding on the scene and Harry Potter exploding on the scene, those authors not only earn money from their books, but they also earn money from the, the movie yeah exactly the movie adaptations which and then with the merchandise on top of that it's a multi-level earning system isn't it 
if yes. are successful. And it's funny because with my marketing and sales brain, that's something that I automatically thought of as I was writing the books. It it made my decision on what my titles were going to be like, what my covers were going to look like, because I always was thinking one step forward. Hmm. Um, but not everybody thinks along those lines, is there? But a title of a book can be just as important as the tagline and the description. It's, it's all got to be intriguing and gripping, hasn't it, for you and the publisher? Certainly. I mean, you know, a book title should be unique and stand out. Like sometimes their book titles come across my desk, which are fine book titles, but I always go on Amazon and plug in a book title in a book search or Kindle search on Amazon to see what shows up. And if there are too many search results, I know that the title maybe needs like a subtitle or a series name to stand out. Or sometimes I encourage authors to go back through the manuscript and sometimes hidden within the pages are just this collection of key, you know, golden words that could just make for such a great title. So sometimes we find it that way. Um, but yeah, you're right. All these things, like you say, it's not just found money. It really is marketing gold for the book. I mean, yeah. you it's a giant TV commercial for your book, having a, a, a you know movie or some kind of merchandise or anything spun off from the book in a big way like that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the possibilities are endless. And it's funny because you see, it's funny you said that because when I did the, the when I hosted the book conference last week, um, one of the things I, I told the writing group was to highlight when they're editing in the editing phase was to highlight anything that really stood out that could be possible, you know, a possible tagline or mm. you know, a good quote that would, you know, be a good selling point, a gripping scene that might be a good selling point and to highlight all these things as they're editing mm -hmm. so that they can go back at a glance and pick those things out afterwards and use for building their book description, building up their query, you know, building up a tagline, et cetera. Um, it, it saves so much time. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I had a client who, you know, he has this book called Everything Under the Moon, and it's the last line of his book, but I thought that's a great title right there. And so it kind of put a nice bow on everything because there it is in the title, and then you get, in it, you know, there's echoes of it in the last lines of the book. That's just fabulous. I absolutely love that. Can you believe we've been on for nearly an hour already, Mark? Oh, my gosh. I know, yeah. right? It's gone so quick. I've got so many more questions. Can I do a quick fire at you just so we can get some of these questions out for our viewers? It's sure. going to be, we might have to get him on again, everybody. Okay. Right. I know that you read all your queries and you have a very hands-on relationship with your mm -hmm. queries, your authors and, and all facets. Do you think that with other publishing, uh, other literary agencies that use a lot of literary assistance, do you think they're more likely to miss a great book due to the assistance lack of experience compared to your level of experience? I mean, yes and no. I mean, some you mentioned Harry Potter that was supposedly discovered by an intern in the slush pile. But, you know, there's always just the human element in things. You know, people, it's not that I don't trust people. It's just, I have faith in humanity. It's just sometimes people can be lazy and you don't know what you will always get unless, you know, you're the person doing it. So I prefer, I myself, prefer to read my own query letters, read my own manuscripts, because I don't really always trust other people's opinions over my own. Yeah. And other agencies will always do a mixture of things you never know. Every agent and every agency is different. So like you say, they might have an intern or they might have a, an assistant doing this stuff. Uh, and, you know, I always say you, you just, because you have to know material, and you have to be, in, you're in, already in touch with what's working well in the marketplace. I don't think someone who's freshly out of college, as well read as they might be, will, will be in in touch with, you know, the marketplace and books in, in the same kind of way. Yeah, maybe pick up elements that are 
triggers for sales that you would pick up, but they're not going to see it. You yeah, just, and it, it is also just too for everyone, regardless of your experience or who you are. Like it being such a subjective business that you have you have to look at all this stuff. So um, yeah. it takes more time, but. It's also amazing how much more productive you are selling something that you are really super passionate about compared to something that you're having to sell that you're not that interested in. Mm -hmm. That makes a whole big difference as well because I'm sure your enthusiasm over a new project is probably quite contagious when you get in front of somebody at a publishing house and you're saying, oh my God, I've read this fantastic book. Oh, you've got to read it. So your enthusiasm over something that's really new and exciting must go a long way as well. Sure, yeah. I mean, sometimes it is exactly like what you say. Other times it is just knowing that a book will work well in the marketplace. And yeah. sometimes I'll work with a book or I'll recommend it to a colleague. There was a, a book by a, like a famous historian on Abraham Lincoln about um, sort of the, it was kind of like a, almost like the, a retelling of Taming of the Shrew. Like there was a, the story of Lincoln's marriage was very difficult. And um, I thought it was, he was an interesting, knowledgeable historian, a unique portion of history. You can't go wrong in, in publishing a book on Lincoln really. But I, I was a little um, worried given the, the world is very politically correct now. And, um, you know, even if he he did have difficulties in his marriage, you know, um, this was right in the midst of sort of the Me Too movement. And so I didn't want to touch a book like that. But I right. saw the promise in it. I recommended it to a colleague and he was able to sell it to a publisher and successfully. He did run up against some challenges, you know, in the process. And some editors had the same kind of feeling I did, but the book eventually found its home. Yeah, it's it's amazing, isn't it? How much um, social public social anxiety over um, social issues can can have such an impact on a on a market, whether it be books, movies, or, or whatever. Um, it can really change overnight, depending on what suddenly erupts on the social scene, mm -hmm. uh, and that must be quite a minefield for you. At, with your business because as you said you know all these things can make a difference as to whether a book will work or not mm -hmm. or whether you need to change the timing as to tr test the market with it because of what's happening it happening in the media oh publishers are very fearsome of the social media mob because they um i mean they've canceled publications over it or changed books because of it you know it's gotten to be very very difficult and so I mean there's it's hard to know what to do I mean it is the democratization of the internet but at the same time like uh, and things are I suppose uh, people should should have a voice but at the same time they don't always know the best thing to do with that yeah. it's a double-edged sword uh, yeah. and so publishers have gotten so sensitive to a lot of these things to the point where we we've seen books get like these sensitivity reads before they're even published and you know publishers have all kinds of discussions around you know basically whether it it'll be a the book is a ticking time bomb or if it's like really going to just be a a good and easy smooth sailing for them basically yeah yeah it's it's amazing isn't it it's only free speech if if it's a minefield put it that way it is an absolute minefield nowadays it really really is um oh scott says um but controversy can also drive sales correct i think it depends scott depends yeah. on the <laughs> there were some books which were just sort of again canceled outright but there were publishers who okay they said this is the funniest thing uh there was a they staged a walk out the employees at simon and schuster they said, we're not going to publish uh, Woody Allen's memoir because they, they had certain ideas about controversies in his life. And they did similar things with, you know, conservative politicians who, you know, during Trump's presidency, it was like such a highly politically charged time. They, they did, they canceled the same 
types of books. The funny thing was these books got picked up by places like Skyhorse Publishing and Regnery, which are, you know, larger independent publishers, but much smaller than a Simon & Schuster. Guess who distributes Regnery and Skyhorse? Simon & Schuster. They never really canceled these books. They just made it look that way to everyone. And and the, the hoo-ha surrounding the whole thing probably helped the book sales as well and the pre-orders. It's amazing, isn't it? I've seen recently, um, you know, certain books, especially children's books, that are all of a sudden under, under scrutiny because of, of, of sensitivity, but it's just going so far left field. It's, it's, it's scary, like Roald Dahl. I, I was brought up on Roald Dahl books. They are so beloved to so many people. And yet, you know, there's there's a element of, of... Yeah, I agree with you. People need people need some kind of perspective on these things and yeah. to just contextualize the books like times were different back then, you know. If you need to put a plaque on it or next to it explaining, you know, why this book was the way it was. But I think I do agree with you. I think it's a big mistake to whitewash history because if you, you know, forget about a lot of the atrocities of history, you know, you're doomed to kind of repeat them. Exactly. You don't learn from them. You don't get chance to educate the younger generation and, and make things better. Um, and I think that's super important. But, you know, a, a lot of times when this sort of thing happens, all that does happen is that the sales go crazy. I mean, Roald Dahl books, all of a sudden, they got a massive surge in sales oh, yeah. um, be because the majority of people want to keep those books and want them in circulation. They want to read them to their children, their grandchildren, and so on and so on. So it, it, it is absolutely crazy. Um, okay, next question for you, Mark. I'm not going to keep you too much longer, I promise, although I could okay. chat to you for hours, I've got to tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, do you pay particular attention to self-published books that are doing really well and are getting many great reviews? Would that make you reach out to that author? Yes and no. I think um, publishers have gotten a lot more um, savvy to how they decide to take on self-published authors. So before, you know, you could show a publisher like, oh, we sold... 50,000 copies of the self-published book. And that is 50,000 copies is like a publisher's, you know, big first printing for probably like one of their key titles, if not one of their lead titles, you know, a lead title might have a printing of, I've seen a quarter of a million copies or more, but, you know, so, but then what happened was um, a lot of these books were priced very low and the audience did a, didn't always translate well because the publisher knew they would be charging more for yeah. these books. So it's it's tricky. I, I would say to convince a publisher to take on uh, a self-published author, what you need is, yes, the reviews, the sales numbers, but also to be able to show that it was at a decent price and um, to show something fresh and new on the marketplace. So not to try to convince a publisher to, you know, take on a book which was already self-published because chances are you kind of already shot your load, you know, that's it. That your audience has been reached. But um, the and to really get in at the ground level. So not, okay, well, I'll give you book three in my, you know, 10 book series. It's a little awkward for the publisher to walk in on the middle of that. It's better if you start with a new series or new standalone title so the publisher can build from there yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and it's amazing because you never know how the market's going to react to something i mean when you think of el james and 50 shades of gray self-published author and all of a sudden she went completely viral so sometimes books just explode on the scene and catch on and no one sees it coming <laughs> Yeah, some of it's very peculiar. Like sometimes, yeah. I mean, the person who picked up that book, oddly enough, was Sunny Mehta at Knopf, who normally a very literary editor, but just has kind of an eye for commercial fiction too. And in a way, E.L. James was also big because 
Penguin Random House decided she would be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's amazing, isn't it? I'll tell you, th this business is just an eye opener. It really, really is. Okay. Now, do you prefer a query which is more formal in description of the author and their book, or do you prefer a query that actually sells you the book with an intriguing pitch that really sells you the story? Ideally, a query letter that can do both, because I always compare it to when you're eating at a restaurant and the waiter comes over, you know, waiters are, are not just waiters, they're, they're the salespeople at restaurants. And they, a bad waiter will kind of just say, you know, here's what the specials are, and they'll read them, them off to you. A good waiter will describe the dishes to you, the specials. You know, your mouth water as he's describing it. <laughs> exactly. And you forget for a moment, you know, that maybe this restaurant is just trying to move old food, you know. Instead, these dishes sound really enticing and uh, you decide to go for it, you know. And that's what you want to do with a query letter, you know. should not just be, like, enticing in terms of, well, there's going to be dynamite explosions, you know, a breakneck plot and everything but should also be well written like not just telling us what the dishes are but make us salivate for the manuscript exactly make you want it okay right when you when you sign up an author um and you cr start that working relationship do you ask do you assess and use their strengths to sell and promote their books so if they have a background in in um, media or you know uh, that that type of thing, do you use those strengths to course. help you? Oh, everything we can use to our advantage. You know, I mean, you're putting a team together, and you know, for instance, if the author is a journalist, you know, I would say to the author, you know, reach out to your contacts in the world of newspapers and magazines, see if you can get them to review the book or interview you, see if you can update your bylines. Like, you know, uh, sometimes you read an article and then there's a byline that says the author of this article is also the author of such and such. Yeah. Um, yeah, as much as you can, it's just sort of pooling your resources together when a book is getting published. Yeah. Use what you know. It says it's a, very important thing, I think. Um, you have a very hands-on and friendly approach with your authors. You have such a good relationship with them. How important is that for you? Is it is it a you know a, a conscious thing where you really want to have good relationships with all the authors that you work with, or does it just come naturally for you? Mm -hmm. I mean, m mostly life is just too short to be anything but pleasant, you know. And yes, I agree. And so that's a big part of it, obviously. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think uh, just making people feel like you're available and that they can speak to you and reach you when they need to helps a lot. And um, I don't know, trying to reach people on a human level. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what else to, to say. Yeah. I think it's great because it really does show what, you know, when I, when I was researching you for the interview, um, that's the one thing that really stood out was the fact that the authors that work with you just have so much respect for you and feel so supported. And mm -hmm. I think that makes all the difference because having somebody like yourself and, you know, backing you in, in your corner and encouraging you and everything else. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a good example. I mean, you know, in growing up, um, cause I work in my family business. My family's worked in publishing, you know, sometimes I would have, you know, an uncle Michael sleeping on the couch in the house. If, you know, his wife had th thrown him out of the house and, you know, he, he, he was a writer and he didn't have any place to go. And so he would stay with us until he was back on his feet. And I think that just impressed upon me, like in ways that I didn't, I don't even, uh, really you know, consciously think about, like, uh, there was a client, I won't say who, but he's flying to New York to do some research for a book that he's publishing with Hachette. And he asked me if I know of any, you know, cheap hotels, because him and his wife are just getting, getting started in their life and everything. And I, initially, I thought to myself, well, I can tell him, 
of some of these cheap hotels or I said, why don't you just come stay at our place? And, you know, my family lives not too far from here. We'll, we'll go stay with my family. So we're out of your way. And then you can go into the city as you need and do your thing. And so he took me up on that. You know, I've done stuff like that before. So, you know, whatever makes it work. Yeah, I, I'm all for good karma. I think that's why I enjoyed creating the group with Autumn is because it's nice to pay it forward and show kindness and hopefully that will come back at some point. And, you know, as you said, life's too short, isn't it? It really, really is. Now, there's something super exciting happening coming at, towards the end of the year because you've you've got the new movie adaptation of Dune mm -hmm. coming up, which is awesome i mean it's an iconic book iconic original movie and now there's a, the new one coming out mm. that must be super exciting for you you must have your hands full mark because you know it's one thing to be working with the author on the book but then you've got you know the the, the foreign rights the movie rights the the negotiation from from making it you know, again, from a book to a, a new movie adaptation. You've got, you wear so many hats. How do you fit all that in? <laughs> I mean, it's not just me working there. We have a team of people. So we have a foreign rights department. You know, we have someone helping with book to film and TV. Yes. Uh, you know, and audio and things like that. And so um, obviously I do work in concert with those places. They don't just ha have these headaches for me you know, I'm involved with, with them and what they're doing, um, meeting with them every week. But we also use, you know, co-agents and co-agencies in helping to sell, you know, a lot of our book to film and TV rights too. So it's not just only me doing this, but yeah. And it does take up a lot of time. I mean, I go to the London book fair, the Frankfurt book fair, we meet with hundreds of editors from all over the world over the course of a week. It's, it's like a speed dating. Every 15 minutes you have a meeting and we pitch our books, you know, to them. Uh, and then I do a similar thing in, in going to Los Angeles every year, although 2020 was obviously a different year. But luckily our last trip was right before all that started. But yeah, we go to Hollywood every year. We meet with a lot of different film and TV production companies, executives in those places, and in a similar way, we're having those meetings, but they're actually more so every hour because we have to drive to different parts of Los Angeles and with the way the traffic is there, we plan our, our meetings. So there's time in between. Yeah. So uh, yeah, some of that does go on, but they also obviously come to our offices throughout the year and meet with us so it's it's not it's not just one way sometimes they're they reach out to us they hear about a book like like you mentioned the dune movie we've heard from a lot of foreign publishers totally unprompted who want to publish the book or renew their licenses on the original dune novels or the new ones yeah which i'm not surprised about because it's got such a big following i mean it's quite the the original book and the original movie has quite a, a a cult following you know so I, I it's really for me it's fantastic to see a book being re-energized and brought into the you know the modern times as it were it's super exciting and I think you're amazing because you go you deal with so many departments you must be going you must walk miles <laughs> from different offices and spend so much time on the phone it's it's absolutely crazy um now, there's been a large increase in original movies and TV adaptations across the board with Hulu, Amazon, Disney, you name it. Mm -hmm. Streaming is becoming huge. Yes. Uh, and it seems to be nearly overtaking the, you know, the the, the normal TV providers. For to, sure. To a point, because who, who likes watching thousands of commercials between each part of your program mm -hmm. um, do you think that um people like amazon etc are now actively seeking new material and original material because they're coming up with so much new stuff aren't they independently mm. uh, yeah are you getting more people contacting you about this it's pretty wild i mean so on the one hand 
you know, you used to have sort of this bottleneck of a system where there were just, it's almost like major trade book publishing, there being only, you know, five main buyers in the film and TV industry. It was like the same thing. You had pretty much four or five main big buyers. And then with streaming, like you say, I think people had this big wake up moment where, why am I paying to watch commercials again? Instead, they would rather pay for, for what they want, almost a la carte. And so in a lot of these, what initially happened was Netflix had a lot of uh, backlist, basically. They had all the stuff that film and TV companies pretty much done before, which kind of like with books, it either lived its moment in a bookstore or, you know, you were watching reruns on TV. There weren't a lot of places where it could look. They were basically relying on box office numbers and things like that, you know, TV commercials, things like that. And then... Netflix put places like Blockbuster out of business, like what's happening with Barnes and Noble and, you know, in, in publishing. And um, yes, yeah, streaming became the norm. But what happened in an interesting turn of events was when these licenses started expiring on Netflix, they used to have a bigger catalog. Paramount was taking a lot of stuff back and saying, we're going to make our own streaming channel or Disney yeah. when licenses were expiring. They were taking their properties back and putting them on their own streaming. So Netflix started saying to itself, well, we need more content. And whereas there was a, a period of time where they were pretty resistant to having new projects. Uh, if you could walk in a project that was all put together. And by that, I mean, you know, it's funded. It, you know, there's a writer, a director, a producer, the actors, it's ready to go to Netflix. They have nothing to lose. It's just putting it on a server. Yeah. So that's where it's become easier. But just trying to go in sometimes without something packaged and put together in any place is really difficult unless the book was like a big bestseller or like they call it in at West, they like to call it like a tentpole property, you know? Um, so you, you need something like that to really convince them to just sort of take it on board out of the blue. And I think it is very, very hard to do that unless you've, you know, I think you had to have gone down the traditional publishing route, created big success for the book, like it's garnered awards or hit bestsellers list because in the eyes of the film and TV community and, and they don't really read too much, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. They, they're they looking at that in terms of all that data. And to them, that's the provenance behind the, the value in the book. Yeah, absolutely. It just, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Mark, I literally could talk to you for hours and talk your ear off because I find you so fascinating, especially with your, your wealth of experience and your achievements and everything else. But Thank you. You've been absolutely amazing. And, and I want to thank everybody who has joined us today. You, you've been wonderful. You really, really have. Um, we've got a few more comments. I'm going to quickly pop them on the screen before we before we finish. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Okay. So I think we've already covered this one. Amy says, should you edit your manuscript before taking an agent? Yes, absolutely. Fine tune that manuscript and get it spot on. It needs to be perfect. It's your first impression. Um, Scott says, no such thing as bad, publi pa right, right. bad publicity. Ha ha. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. With the, with the cancel culture that's going on at the moment, I think sometimes there can. You just never know. Uh, Terza agrees with you, Mark. She says, agreed, lead with kindness. Absolutely. And um, oh, and when, Wendy says, oh, there we go. Wendy says, thank you both. I really enjoyed this. Oh, they have been absolutely fantastic. Mark, please stay with me because I'd like to say a thank you after we finish. But you've been absolutely amazing. And I love the fact that you're so candid and you're so honest um, when it comes to talking about the publishing world. And it all the information you've given us is so valuable. Mm -hmm. It really, really is. Um, is there any last things you would like to, to say to our viewers that they can take away for future reference, no matter what level 
they are in their writing career? I would say, you know, just given how scary a year 2020 was that you have to realize that, you know, publishing is still here. Publishers are still buying books and they are not thinking about necessarily what 2020 was like or what today is like. They, Whenever they're buying a book, you know, they're thinking one to two years in the future. So they're, they're thinking of a brighter future. So I think authors should remain optimistic and, you know, eager to seek out you know, publishers for their books. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's never too late. Um, I don't think it's, no matter what your age is, it's never too late. To... I couldn't agree with that more either. I have a lot of clients who made their debuts, you know, sometimes even after retirement. Yeah, uh, which let's face it, it's when most people have got the most time because all the kids have left home, their careers are, you know, ending their, they've got the time and opportunity to do it. So, chase your dreams, chase your goals, create your opportunities, everybody, because if you don't go for it, nothing's going to happen. So, so chase those dreams and get those books out there. Mark, thank you so much, darling. You've been an absolute pleasure to chat to. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, our viewers, as always, have been fantastic. And hopefully we will see you all on Thursday for the next Witty Writers Show. And uh, we will keep you updated and as to what we're going to do next. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you at the next Witty Writers Show. Bye for now, everybody. Mm -hmm.